In Galatians 3.13, Paul writes, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Wait a minute. Stop. Does curse and God and curse and Jesus bother you? I mean, do they seem like those words should even be in the same sentence? <laughs> if you struggle with that, like I struggled with it, then I hope you'll join me today. Hey, I'm Andy Lee. Thank you so much for joining me on my channel today. I pray that this blesses you, that it helps you understand this scripture, and if so, that you might share it to encourage someone else. I have a website, it's wordsbyandylee.com, and every month I give a Bible reading plan to help you just know where to start to read the Bible every day, because you know, we don't get to heaven by reading our Bible, but reading our Bible gets heaven in us. So this month, this is the month of June in 2024, we are studying the names of Jesus. And this month is Redeemer, the name and title of Jesus as Redeemer. Honestly, y'all, I think this is one of the most important names we could study is the name Redeemer. I'm so thankful for this name of Jesus. This week, one of our scriptures on the reading plan was Galatians 3.13. I kind of wish I would have added 14, but I really do hope that this is just a stepping off point for you. And you read the scriptures and then you read a little bit more after it, or you go, oh, I need to understand this context. And so you read some above it too. And it's just a stepping off place for you to read and study for the day. So my whole point of this is to cheer you on in your faith, to help you understand the scriptures. So let's get into the word because my words might encourage you. I love to be a cheerleader, but it's the Word of God that really will change us and encourage us. I thank you for being encouraged today. So Galatians 3, 13 and 14, as I said in the introduction, Paul wrote, Christ redeemed us. Let me stop really quick. I've been doing um, videos on redeem, and if you've missed those, you might want to go back and watch them to fully understand redeem. But just to summarize it up, if you have been redeemed um, spiritually, so the spiritual meaning of redemption is to be ransomed, to be purchased and bought back out of slavery. He ransomed us. He redeemed us from the slavery of sin and death with his own blood. It cost him something. Just like when you have a coupon and you want to redeem that coupon, when you want to activate it, give it some value, turn it into something good, not just a piece of paper, right? You have to purchase something. You have to buy something to redeem it. The same concept. Jesus, it cost his life to redeem us. We'll keep on reading and studying, and I think this will become clear. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Stop. So curse, the curse of the law. That word curse really bothered me when I read it. And then it says, he became a curse for us. It's used three times. And then um, Paul writes a, about another scripture, a scripture in the law, a scripture in the Torah, which is in Deuteronomy, that cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So let's talk about that word cursed. 
anytime you read something that you're just like, oh, I'm struggling with that, that is your invitation to do some digging and to do some studying. And there's so many good resources out there. Bible, um, BibleGateway.com, BlueLetterBible.com. That, that online source will let you go to the ancient language and see the Strong's definitions. And you probably might be like, well, why do I need to do that? Well, because it's an ancient language. There's so many translations because it's not a specific science. Yes, there are some grammar rules that the translators have used. Um, they can look at the context, but there are so many translations that that's proof that this is not a perfect science. And so as you read the different definitions of a word and what it could mean, it just to me, it just comes to life and you go, oh, I understand this a little bit better. So, the word curse, I'm not even going to try to say the Hebrew word for you here, but the Hebrew word for curse, um, the different meanings that it has, I, the definitions and strongs, one was anathema. Anathema, which is a word I've never used in my life, a word I'd, I had to look up to see what this English word meant. And um, anathema is a formal curse. Anathema is a word that's used in the um, Catholic Church when a pope excommunicates a person from the church, which I think is really interesting if you think about it this way, that the curse here of the law is being being excommunicated. The curse of the law is being separated from the presence of God. So that's an interesting way to understand the word curse in this scripture. The opposite of this Hebrew word that has been um, translated as curse is bless. So the opposite of curse is bless. And that's going to bring us to our covenant that we that will help us understand the curse of the law, understanding this covenant. Let me go back and read the context here because context is everything, right? Never, never try to understand a scripture until you've looked at the context. And first of all, the context of this letter, giving them a solution or even trying to help them understand um, what the truth was in that problem. And the problem in Galatia here in this church was that there were Judaizers who came along who said, well, you can believe in Jesus, but you've also got to follow the law to the T. Now, let me tell you, Jesus did not take away their Jewishness. He added to it because he was the fulfillment of that law, right? You getting me here? So the Judaizers were saying you gotta do both. You gotta you know, you believe in Jesus, but you also have to follow the law. And Paul is saying, No, you don't have to do that. So let me read verse ten. All who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one is justified before God by the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of from the doom of punishment, from the um, problem of being excommunicated from God of the law by becoming a curse for us, by becoming excommunicated from God, by becoming separated from God, by being punished um, for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Let me read the scripture that um, this is coming from. So Paul is referring to a scripture 
in Deuteronomy, which is the law, which is the Torah and the law that they were following. Deuteronomy 21, 22. If a man guilty of a capital offense is put to death and his body is hung on a tree, you must not leave his body on the tree overnight. Be sure to bury him the same day because anyone who is hung on a tree is under God's curse. So that's the connection of calling um, Jesus on the cross becoming a curse for us. Now go back with me to Adam and Eve. Go back with me to the Garden of Eden and remember when they fell. Remember when they obeyed the serpent rather than trusting God and they listened to the serpent and ate of the fruit. What happened? They were excommunicated from the garden, right? They could no longer go into the garden. They were excommunicated from the presence of God where they walked with him in the afternoon. They were excommunicated from the ability to get to the fruit of the tree of life so that they could live forever. That was part of the curse. I mean, God said, because you've done what you've done, you are cursed. You can't go into the garden anymore. Adam, you are going to work and toil and there's going to be thorns and thistles and and Eve, you're going to have babies and it's going to be painful when that happens. We still see that there is still that element of that curse, right? That has not been completely eradicated yet, right? But then came along a guy named Abraham. Now, this is the key. This is important because there's the curse from the garden. Abraham comes. We're going to talk about Abraham's promise in just a minute. Moses comes along with all these people, and that's when we get this law. The Ten Commandments came down then, right? They get the Ten Commandments. They get the the rules for living, how they need to live. And in that covenant that is set up with Moses and the Israelites, it is a covenant of blessings and curses. The covenant is, if you obey me, you love me, I'm your, I'm the one you worship, and you don't follow any other gods, you're going to be blessed. But if you turn and you follow other gods, I'm not going to bless you. You are separating yourself from me. You are, you've turned your own way, and there is the curse of, of walking into that curse like like Adam was of the things bad things hard things happening you know toil in the soil and and so do you see the the difference here we have a cut or the similarities of Adam and that covenant and the covenant of curse their blessing and curse and then the covenant and the blessing and curse with Moses but in between that was Abraham and God loved Abraham. He was one of his favorites. I mean, I could say he was his favorite at the time. And he called Abraham. And Abraham was a man of great faith who blindly followed God as God told him to leave everything he knew, to leave his land, and God would take him to another land, the land of Canaan. He had no idea where he was going, but God also gave him a promise, a very special promise. And I'm going to read that because Galatians is going to talk about this promise. If you go with me to Genesis, Genesis 15, you're going to hear about this promise. So after this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. He's not even Abraham yet. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And I've got this dude who's going to take over. I have no children. 
So he's going to be my, he's going to inherit my estate. And God said, don't worry about that. The word of the Lord came to him. The man will not be your heir, but a son is coming from your own body, and he will be your heir. And he took him outside. And he said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, and indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham, this is verse 6, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. Okay, hang on that, that scripture, and let's go back to Galatians Galatians 3, 14. He, meaning Christ, redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. What promise was given to Abraham? The promise was a son. The promise was um children and children and great children and great 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 this huge family so big you couldn't even count the the people you couldn't even count them like you couldn't count the stars that was the blessing to abraham that was the promise to abraham and what's so amazing is now we under the this new covenant remember jesus said Right? And the, the Last Supper, he held up the cup and he said, This is my blood. He said, This is the new covenant that was given to you. So he redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles. So before it was just the law was just for God's people. For, for the Jewish people, his people. But then the law wasn't able to change their hearts. The law just showed them how much they needed God, right? And so at just the right time, Jesus came. He became that, that curse, that separation, that he took on that punishment on the pole, on the tree, on the cross for us. Right? I love to in Deuteronomy where it said, don't let them hang there through the night. You, you got to bury them. Think about Jesus on the cross and when he died. Of course, the Sabbath was coming, but they did not let him hang there through the night. They took him down. They put him in the tomb. They followed the law there, which I think is really interesting. Um, so now... We are saved by faith. We are in this new covenant era. And we're saved by faith. And we receive the promise of the Spirit of Jesus. How beautiful is that in our redemption. But it doesn't stop there. i got to keep on reading. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions until the capital S seed, that would be Jesus, to whom the promise referred had come. The law was to put into effect through angels by mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one. Is the law therefore opposed to the promise of God? Absolutely not. For if the law had been able to give life, impart life, then righteousness would certainly have come through the law. But the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin, and so that what was promised, being given through faith in Jesus Christ, must be given to all who believe. Look at our God. Look at our God. I think so many times I read the Old Testament, and I'm like, ah! This is painful. Yeah, there's this people die and there's this curse word. And, but the Old Testament is 
what happens. I mean, it just shows what life is like, what judgment is like without Jesus, without his redemption, what he's done for us, without the Redeemer. That's what the Old Testament shows us, shows us our need for a Redeemer. God is a just God, he, but he's a God who um, is holy and pure and pure goodness. And, and sin cannot stand in that place. And so that's what the Old Testament looks like. And then there's the New Testament. And we live, we've lived, we have not known anything other than living in the New Testament era, right? And on the other side of the cross, the New Testament shows us the, the new covenant, the final covenant of redemption, of grace, of walking with God in this new way with His Holy Spirit present in us, y'all. It's beautiful, so beautiful. Verse 23, before this faith came, we were held prisoners by the law, locked up until faith should be revealed. So the law was put into charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Now that faith has come, we are no longer under the supervision of the law. Doesn't mean the law is wrong, but it means now faith is more important. You are all sons of God, sons and daughters of God, through faith, through trusting Christ Jesus, for all who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is therefore neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Wow. Somebody say hallelujah. Somebody say amen. Y'all, it goes all the way back to Abraham. This promise. Ha! Huh. We are heirs of the promise. It is such a beautiful thing. God does not miss one detail. God does not miss the perfect timing. God does not miss anything. He is faithful. He is wise. He is good. And I want to close today with Psalm 130 verse 7, which is also on our reading plan this week. Psalm 130, y'all, starting with verse 7, and then I'm going to go up. Oh, put your hope in Yahweh, for Yahweh with Yahweh is unfailing love. That word is hesed. That word means merciful, loving kindness, acts of loving kindness bound by a covenant. So, O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord, in Yahweh. For with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. But above that, I wait. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I put my hope. Where is your hope today? Where's your hope? It's got to be in his word. It's got to be in him. As we wait on him, our hope cannot be in the, um, the market changing. The hope cannot be in a new election. The hope cannot be in your new job that you want or that marriage you want so much or you fill in that blank. Our hope lies here in the promise of the word. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. So, O oh Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with him is unfailing chesed, 
a covenant of chesed, and with him is full redemption. Oh, I pray, I pray, I pray that that blessed somebody today. If that blessed you, give me some hearts in the comment. Show me how that has been encouraging to you. Y'all, we don't live under that curse anymore. If we have stepped out in faith and trusted in the Redeemer, we trust in the promise. We've accepted Holy Spirit in our lives and we're working with Holy Spirit, y'all. It's a beautiful thing. Hold my hands. Let me pray you up. Jesus, oh, the Redeemer, we are so thankful for you. Oh, we can't imagine what you have gone through. You have become a curse for us. You took on the punishment for our sins, for the sins of the world, so that the, the floodgates could be open to not just the Jewish people, but to the whole world that was under that curse of Adam and Eve, under the curse of the law, the opposite, the blessings and the curses. Now we walk by faith. Now we're righteous by faith. And we can claim these promises of eternity forever with you. Oh Lord, I pray for holiness. I pray for righteousness. I pray for this hunger, hunger for your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Redeemer. Thank you, Father God. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time. Just come on back to Andy Lee Bible or go to my website, wordsbyandylee.com. See you soon.